And he starts the story out with September 13th, 2022, when King Charles had gone to a remembrance service for his mother. It was all a very pleasant setting. He writes that uh, with an audience present solely to commemorate the late queen and honor their new sovereign, Charles couldn't constrain his frustration and legendary irascibility. While signing the castle's visitor's book, he suddenly lost his cool, throwing what can only be called a petulant temper tantrum. His target? A leaky fountain pen. Caught on video, it was an amusing but revealing scene. Sitting at an antique wooden desk, dressed up with a vase of lilies and a gold royal accoutrement, Charles, already cranky from writing in the wrong date, now faced the calamity of a malfunctioning pen. Noticing the leaky ink, he blurted out, Oh God, I hate this pen. After he stood up and brusquely handed it to his queen, who was equally irked, Oh look, it's going everywhere. The new king grumpily wiped his fingers. He was almost to the point of stamping his feet when he said through gritted teeth, I can't bear this bloody thing every stinking time. Shoving his inky handkerchief into his pocket, Charles left the room in a grumble while Camilla sat calmly down and signed the book. She did what most of us would have done in that situation. A simple solution, really. She just used another pen. Oh, look, it's going everywhere. Hang on. So nobody got a job. Where is the lamp? Oh, look, it's so good. Oh, there it is. Oh, look, it's so good. Oh, look, it's so good. Oh, look, it's so good. Well... The reality is this is worthy of criticism, but it's also pretty low hanging fruit when you're trying to criticize the royal family. I feel like for an instance that is has already been roundly picked apart, of course you can mention it in a book. If the, if the whole point of the book is to say, look at these jokers, they can't hold a candle to his mom. Sure. Uh you would have to you would have to include this episode. But you need to go deeper than this. Like, this can't be what you're hanging your hat on. And it kind of feels like he is. Because he goes on for, like, five more pages about it. We're not going to. But he just keeps bringing it up and bringing it up. And that's one of the things about Omid Scobie. Is that he will say... Like, he will take a chapter. And then he will reiterate the same thing about seven different ways. But he's not ever making any new points. Now, as a person who also talks too much and says the same thing seven different ways, I can really sense it when I see it. And you know how, like, your worst traits you notice in others. Well, I see that Omid Scobie shares the same tendency I have to keep saying the same thing, but not in a new way. And that's a fault that I have that I know. I've edited enough of my stuff to know I do that. But the difference is, where was his editor? Why wasn't somebody like, slash, 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 you've already said this. Okay, so uh, he goes on and on, like I said, for quite a long time. King and people kept wanting to compare him to his mother. Um, Omid says, let's not forget also that Prince Philip was his dad. And this was a real F Prince Philip moment. I don't really know much about Prince Philip, if I'm 100% honest with you. I know the Queen really cared for him and loved him and thought he was great. So I've always just taken that as all I needed to know. Um, if he was prickly and interesting, uh, okay. But I think that it would be nice to have a person in the family like that who doesn't always do and say the exact right thing because that makes life interesting. All right, but he keeps on about the point, about the pen. Then he says that to make matters worse, a mere 48 hours after the Queen's death, while signing the historic proclamation of his new position as King and Henry VIII's St. James Palace, Charles furiously gestured to his private secretary, Clive Alderton, to remove a tray of pens, bloody stationary again, and an ink pot, which was an old gift from his sons, baring his teeth in a grimace as he nearly pushed the lot off the desk. Naturally, with little concern for optics, he did this with the world watching and waiting to see the new king in action. Online clips and headlines quickly followed. Despite the occasion solemnity, there was the new monarch publicly making a fuss over a frivolity, bungling his special moment by flashing his temper during the official proceedings for his own ascension while signing his very first document as king. Again, could one expect the, a person writing a book against the royal family wouldn't mention these things? Of course, you know, so I'm not like shocked. I'm not clutching my chest like, how can you mention this? How can you talk ugly? Because the truth is these moments did not reflect well on Charles. And I think that the reality is, is that if any of us had to ascend the throne after such a class act as his mother who reigned and ruled beautifully for 70 years, I think all of us would suffer from some extreme anxiety, especially when our temperament was so different from hers. So already, I think the anxiety of the moment would lead you to feel on edge. And probably if you did suffer from sort of like, if temper was kind of your thing, like you kind of had a problem with your temper, this wouldn't be the best environment in which to sort of cull that. And I think that I'm, that 
to continually say, why aren't you your mom? Why aren't you mo- your mom? That's not really fair because he's not his mom. Did he ever promise us that he would be? His entire, like leading up to becoming king, he, he kept talking about how he wanted to make it different. He wanted the monarchy to be slimmed down and reflect more modernity. So I, I don't think people need to be shocked and chagrin that he isn't his mom. And I think people need to let him do his own thing. But doing your own thing does not mean that you have temper tantrums and that you act foolishly when something is mildly inconvenient. I think that it was right for people to call him out. I think he needed a reminder that he's not a prince anymore. He is now a king. So you, you know, whatever little bursts of um, irritability that you may have been able to get away with before, you are under a microscope now. And people do want to see differently now. You don't have to be like your mom, but if your mom was known for being calm, cool, and collected, and people are still grieving that sense of stability that she brought to an unstable world, you may be unlike her in every respect, but the one place for you to come dancing out and showing, you know, your personality should not be an irritability and unstable emotional outbursts. People are not opposed to change necessarily with what you're going to do with the monarchy, but people want your personality to be one that feels trustworthy and freaking out several times in, you know, 48 hour span of each other about pens that inconvenience you, that's not a great look. So I'm not surprised that Omid Scobie had something to say about it. Um, and I, I agree that it wasn't a good look for Charles. I just think that Omid is leaning too heavily on this example because it can't be denied it was a bad look, but he really, really, really needs you to buy that this shows that Charles is incapable of doing the job. And I just don't agree with that. Just when you're like, how much longer is he going to drag this these two sad little stories along? He so needs to drive home the point with you that this was bad that he decides to offer up one of the most paltry little analogies you've maybe ever heard. He writes, It demonstrated that Charles and the institution still hadn't grasped the power of social media and the internet, a fact that frankly seems blindly incompetent at best. Think of it this way. Imagine if Apple had decades to roll out a revolutionary new successor to the iPhone, one they'd spent a great deal of time and money hyping up as an emblem of the next generation of communication, and then clumsily unveiled with great fanfare, a throwback temperamental flip phone riddled with software bugs, and doing so while somehow unaware that they were under a microscope and it was the mercy of trends, unceasing opinion, and the New World Order's outrage machine. What kind of analogy is that? That's not at all what this was. This was somebody who like was grieving his mother and acted out temperamentally because he was under so much strain, stress, anxiety, and grief. Somebody freaking out about a pen that's leaking all over their hands uh, while they're dressed for a very somber occasion and you know don't want to be covered with ink. That's not the same thing as Apple telling us they had something better than the iPhone and then giving us an old flip phone that's full of software bugs. Like, that's not even, that's not even a close analogy as to what this was. Not even kind of. And that is when I was just like, all right, man, you, you really overstepped your bounds here. This could have been a point in the book where you would have had a lot of people going, you know what? He is right. If he'd scaled back the criticism and then didn't end it with this phony baloney foolishness. Okay. Then, uh, so this is supposed to make us all feel better. Um, he says that a lot of people tried to brush off the blunders of King Charles by saying that it was nothing more than harmless gaffes, all of those of President Joe Biden. And, you know, it's just a little bit of grouchiness. Okay. I don't think that any of us are going like, oh, that didn't age well now that we know that Joe Biden is not mentally competent. Now that we're all willing to admit that. Uh, but even way back in the day, four years ago, uh, <laughs> Those of us who had were paying attention whatsoever knew that Joe Biden was not mentally competent to do the job of president. And, you know, it, it wasn't just one side of media saying this. There was a couple of people willing to be honest about the fact that Joe Biden didn't seem well. And every other country in the world, everyone was like, is that guy OK? So for anybody to try to comfort themselves by saying, oh, you know, King Charles is just the same as Joe Biden. It's just a little, just a little gaff, little faux pas, just a little, you know, little nothing. Don't worry about it. If I had been King Charles and I heard anybody compare me to Joe Biden, I would have flipped out. You want to talk about being upset? That would have upset me. For anybody to compare me and be like, oh, he's just as, you know, it's just, it's just the same level of competency. I would have just died a thousand deaths. 
All right. Well, to continue on, um, he was annoyed, apparently, says the insiders, and according to Omid Scobie, so how much can we believe this? But apparently, it really annoyed King Charles to always have people say, well, the queen would have done it that way, or the queen would have done this, or she didn't like that. And it didn't help that so early in his reign, sources close to the king claimed that he was already a little frustrated by the burden of the daily red box paper shuffling and rubber stamping, the executive work that Queen Elizabeth relished and considered an anchoring component of her position. Right out of the gate, Charles was a little overwhelmed by it all, easily irked, and perhaps even a bit wistful for his former job as heir apparent and the freedom it provided. Although he had official duties as Prince of Wales, he was less restricted to express frustration or passion, and in some cases he was free to crusade for issues like sustainability in the private sector and alternate medicines. As the new role transforms him, the job requiring quiet forbearance instead of vigorous debate, the opinionated activist prince must retreat behind the stately remove of the king's throne. Adopt, adapt, and abide, just like his mother did. Apparently he's chafed by that. Everything's going wrong is what this book is basically saying. You know, he can't do the job without throwing a fit. And also he's just super annoyed by everybody bringing up his mom all the time because he wants to do it his own way. Leave me alone. Um, but one of the things that really became a struggle between Charles and the government, um, because he's got quite a struggle ahead of him. And this goes on for four pages of which I'm going to skip, but I'll give you the end bit. One of his new struggles now is not just the fact that pens are leaking all over himself and everyone keeps throwing a red box at him full of papers he has to rubber stamp. One of the issues now is that he does not want the coronation to be this super big, showy, expensive affair. He wants a very streamlined, stripped down coronation because he thought that the public would accept that more than the royals with all their pomp showing, you know, this huge regal event and just wasting a bunch of the taxpayers' money. That's how he was afraid it would look. And so he didn't want to do something like that. He thought that he was really giving the public what they wanted. The government, however, was like, no, 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 no. We're going to have a big thing here. This is a big deal. Okay. We want all the pomp. We want all the elegance. We want all the regality. We want it all. And so do the people too. So don't cheat us out of that good time. We, we've all been wanting to have the kids around here are all too little to be expect a wedding out of them anytime soon. There's not the next Jubilee is going to be in 25 years. You know, when is our next Royal event going to be none that we can see. So let's have a good time while we can. So they fought about that back and forth. Charles still thinking that it would look better if they weren't wasting money, as he saw it. And the government still saying, no, 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 we want our own way. So that whole conversation is tied together by this last paragraph that says, while Charles wanted to downsize, Sunak and Whitehall, the government, envisioned a full fat celebratory weekend, the full Monty of carriages, a big concert, a national celebration. The firm saw the coronation as a chance to exude importance through prudence and sensitivity. But the government wanted to distract and redirect by way of extravagance and Ballyhoo. It was a two-for-one deal. A good old-fashioned royal performance would divert public attention from the crisis at home. The pre-coronation media hype would dominate the news cycle for months and stimulate an image repair process for Britain on the global stage. A source said it was the Queen's funeral that reminded Sunak and other ministers that a proper royal occasion draws an international audience like no other and puts a momentary gloss on reality. The government's stance was to harness this moment. The country could use a little bit of Brand Britain and the public some entertaining diversion. So, uh, in the end, the King acquiesced to the demands of the government and had the big ceremony that they wanted. I don't think that was a bad idea. I never really could figure out what Scobud was trying to get at there. Just that there was tensions between Charles and the government. He never really seems like he took a real hard stance on that. I mean, he does seem like he kind of thought the government, you know, untrustworthy fools that they are, were just trying to distract the people from the fact they can't afford anything. Um, and again, he's not completely wrong. But at the same time, if you're going to have a monarchy and you're going to have the royals as part of your culture, why not give the people what they want? People love a royal celebration. It's fun. It's unusual. It's different. You don't get to do these things all the time. It's not just Great Britain that enjoys it. It is the entire world. Everyone gets excited about this, this little bit of distraction. And I don't think that that's an evil thing to enjoy, you know, beauty and the, the elegance and the grandeur of an event, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs>